how did I even find out about this issue? I read a book. Books can be very dangerous, right? <laughs> and the book I read is called We're All in This Together, written by a registrant who talked about his life on the registry. The author of that book is with us today, Frank Lindsay. Frank, please stand up. <laughs> and when he, I read that book, I could not believe that in our country, we are treating any citizen the way we treated Frank. And what I've learned since then is our people treated even worse than Frank. And so that outrage that I felt, I just decided I have to do something about it. So let me tell you a little bit about California in case you don't know about us. We have over 93,000 registrants, okay? In one county alone, Los Angeles County, we have over 11,000 registrants in that county alone. That's more than most states. I think I heard New Mexico has 3,000. We have 11,000 plus in LA County alone. That's how big our problem is. And our state legislature, compounded by the county governments and the city governments, just cannot get their fill of passing more and more laws that prohibit what anybody on the registry does. And I mean anybody. We don't have tiers, okay? So if you are a public peer, you're being treated the same as Phil Garrido and John Gardner. The very same. There is no distinction. Okay. So, um, and by the way, when I talk about California RSOL to the public, I have changed my language. I don't say sex offender, I do say registrant. I'm still looking for a better term, Norm, if you have one, let me know. Um, and I don't talk about 93,000 plus individuals anymore. I talk about 93,000 families, because as we know, it's a family issue. I mean, so many of you in this room today are members of a family in which a registrant lives. Okay, so one of the other things about California that is, I thought, unique, I'm getting a little confused about this, but until I came to the conference, I thought that California was only one of four states in our nation that has a lifetime registry for all registrants. If I'm incorrect in that, I'd really like to be corrected because I really like to give out um, correct information. So anyway, that's why the sick joke is, it's like the song Hotel California in the state of California, which means you can check out, but you can never leave. You're on that registry and you're stuck for the rest of your life. And no matter how many ex post facto laws I keep passing. So a little bit more about the organization, um, maybe because I'm a lawyer, maybe just because I am who I am, um, I decided we needed some infrastructure because when I agreed to be a state organizer, the only thing California RSOL had to its name was a Facebook page. And I'm not even a Facebook person. I was like, hmm, well, what am I going to do? So about one year ago, we incorporated in the state of California. The next month, we applied for tax-exempt status with the, with the IRS and with the state. So what we did is we created some legal infrastructure. So September, we, or, we incorporated. October, we applied for tax-exempt status. And we had our first public meeting. Oh my gosh, how crazy is that? So anyway, it's like, well, what is a public meeting for registrants or RSO? I didn't know. So we thought, okay, let's do, let's be brave. Let's send out a thousand letters. And that's what we did. We found a location. And by the way, the first location we chose was a church in LA known for civil rights. We chose that Presbyterian church on purpose. I'm a former Presbyterian. I didn't become former because of this, but anyway. Um, the fact is that that church told us about two and a half weeks before our event, we couldn't have it there. They'd already cashed our check, oh, my personal check. They'd already, you know, I'd already signed a contract, everything. And they made some excuses to begin with. And then finally they admitted it. You're, we can't have sex offenders coming to our church. And I was so disappointed, and not to mention in a panic, because we'd sent out a thousand letters to people. We didn't have any other contact information for them. So I cried. I actually cried on the phone <laughs> when the church called me. And, uh, and I said, gosh, you've got to make it better. And they said, well, what if we give you the money for your postage? <laughs> 
what if we do this? What if we do that? So they did their best. They gave us money for the postage. They gave us some other money, and they actually threw in an extra 100 bucks. But still, we were like, oh my gosh, where do we have our meeting? And we thought, ACLU. <laughs> ACLU. Maybe they care about us. Maybe they don't, but they have a meeting place. So LA actually, in ACLU in LA has a whole building. And so we contacted them, and they said, yes, for the mere sum of... 450 treasure, 450 bucks you can meet here. We were in a panic. So we said yes, and I paid $450 to meet there. In addition to the original postage and all that other stuff. So you're getting a theme here. If you're planning to have a state organization, you need some resources to begin with, okay? And when I make a commitment, I'm all in. Okay, so um, so we did that. Okay, create your infrastructure. Incorporate, please incorporate legal liability for no other reason. Incorporate. I'll talk to you about that privately later. You, you need to establish a board of directors and bylaws. A board of directors can be a minimum of three people. You got three people in your family? Create a board of directors. That's it. Okay, bylaws. I got some bylaws. You need bylaws. I'll send you bylaws. Pleh. Whoever reads the damn things. Okay, uh, and you have to make a decision about your nonprofit status. I highly recommend when it comes to the feds, you choose um, a 501c4 so that you can lobby and you can advocate and nobody can question you later. If you choose a 501c3, your lobbying and advocacy is very limited and they can take away your nonprofit status if you cross the line. More about that some other time over a glass of wine. Okay. So legal infrastructure is really important. Next, we created physical infrastructure. We have the greatest number of registrants in one county, Los Angeles. I don't live in LA. I don't want to live in LA. Nobody else in the movement to begin with lived in LA. So we went and got a mailbox, not a post office box, we got a mailbox. The reason that's important is the mailbox would transfer mail to me and my home. Okay, but everybody thinks the organization's in LA. So I love it, you know, they're three hours away from me. So anyway, it's really a good idea. Okay, next, a website, you need a website. You may not need a Facebook page, but you need a website. Oh, by the way, National RSOL sprung that on me after I said yes to being state organizer. I go, wait a minute, I have a law degree. I can use my email, but I don't know how to put together a website. But guess what, Mike, are you in the room, Mike? I think I just saw him leaving. But anyway, Mike, who now does national RSOL at that point, was offering his services for free to establish a website. And guess what? Lots of kids know how to do that. My kids probably could have done it, but they weren't busy. So anyway, um, so create a website. And even if you have to have a basic website like we did to begin with, I called it a Dick and Jane website, it's a good, pl good place to start. You have a presence. If somebody wants to find out about it, doom, 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 before you know it, boom, there at least you have some basic information. The other thing that I recommend highly is get an unlimited cell phone pro um, uh, plan, okay? Unlimited minutes, because you're going you're gonna to exceed them no matter what. Just go ahead, bite the bullet, get unlimited minutes if you don't already have them. Because um, I know when we had the state organization panel, um, you know, all three of us, like, we have phone calls that last at least an hour. How are you going to cut somebody off when they're just opening their heart to you and telling you about all these challenges that they're facing? Go, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm low on minutes this month. i got to go. No, I, I don't recommend that approach. If you have to do it, you have to do it. But that's something that I did early on, and I'm damn glad that I did it. Okay. Um, now, once you have a legal and physical infrastructure, guess what? You're going to attract resources. Yay! resources. So you will attract money and you will attract volunteers. That's what you need to make the world go around, doesn't it? Right? Yeah. So you want this infrastructure set up. Then it's like, well, okay, but what if people, they're kind of on the fence. Why should I send you money anyway? I got to pay the bills. I got to do this, that, the other. We came up with something. Please borrow this, anybody. A $10 challenge. So I heard Larry Neely, a $20 challenge on the national level, and he's saying about was it 10% of the national registry, and if everybody on that would give them $20, forget about that. In California, I want $10 for every single registrant. Now, just do a little math. We got 93,000 resident registrants times 10. It's almost $1 million. If I had that just once, I'd be set for a really long time. And you know what? The registrant, him or herself, doesn't have to provide the $10. You can. 
as a family member, right? Anybody can. The neighbor can. You just believe in the cost. Send $10. Send $100 if you want to support 10 registrants. That's one thing we've done, and it's had some uh, success. The biggest and best thing was putting our donate button, right, <laughs> on our website. So that was after we upgraded our website. And what I did is I put out a call at one of our LA meetings. You know, we got a Dick and Jane website. We need to grow up. And sure enough, there was a mom in the audience who said, I I'm sm got a smoking hot computer. I can do that for you. Cool. For free. Double cool. So we now have a smoking hot um, website where we can put photos and video and all the stuff that you really need for a real website. Plus, of course, our PayPal donate button. So we've raised money that way as well. And uh, by that way, I'm a little old fashioned. I do send thank you notes. They send me 10 bucks, they send me 20, they send me $1,000, they get a thank you note. Nicer card stock if it's 1,000, let me tell you. Okay. <laughs> So we came up really with three buzzwords, with three basic missions for the organization, which I invite you to consider. They're, they're, here they are, educate, legislate, and litigate. Not necessarily in that order, the order's up to you. That's kind of the order we're doing things, but you know, it's up for grabs. So educate, legislate, and litigate. So who do you need to educate? Everybody, practically. Well, the first person I started with was myself. I didn't, need, I didn't know all the things I need to know. I still don't know all the things I need to know, which is one reason I come to this conference. So I also have not been a student of history in the past. I guess I had some bad history teachers or something. I'll blame it on them. Uh, not that I wasn't interested, of course. But anyway, now I am more interested. A and you know, it, it's important to know that societies many times seem to have to have a scapegoat, right? So you think about, hmm, Nazi Germany, it was the Jews. You think about our country, the McCarthy era. You think about our country, people of Japanese American descent. You think of our country, African Americans. How about women? You know, we had quite a few, and now it seems to be sex offenders. I don't want them to find a new scapegoat. What I want them to do is knock it off, okay? And we're going to do that by education, okay? Um, registrants and families need to be educated as well. Again, in California, we have all these laws popping up all the time. The folks in Sacramento were getting better at stomping on those, but the fact is we've got counties and cities now. Oh, let's pass a Halloween ordinance. No, no child has ever, 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 ever been attacked while trick-or-treating on Halloween, but we are going to spend, as a state, tens of millions of dollars every Halloween Eve, rounding up those on probation and making them sleep in a tent on cots with law enforcement. Really? Does that remind you of anything? Reminds me of Nazi Germany, right? Now, the difference is they let them go and they didn't gas them th th so far, but who knows what's coming next, okay? Oh, and by the way, I have been quoted in the LA Times saying, yes, this is reminiscent of Nazi Germany, uh, uh, referring to Operation Boo in California. So if you want to quote me saying that, it's okay. It's in the LA Times. Must be true. Okay. <laughs> we, <laughs> we talked to them, too, about things like residency restrictions. It's a big mess in our state. We have some counties enforcing them. We have other counties that are not enforcing them. And we got this case before our state Supreme Court. It's been two freaking years. Nobody knows what to do. They really don't. And I, I mean, my heart goes out to registrants. I don't exactly know what to tell them. It's like, you know what? Okay, I can tell them that this county of Riverside is handing out uh, stays of enforcement for residency restrictions like jelly beans. If you come to me, I'll write you rid of habeas corpus and I can't ever guarantee a result, but so far, 100% success rate, right? Um, we got LA County that said, oh, to heck with it, this is just too hard. Remember, we got more than 11,000 in that county. We got San Diego, a brave judge down, I'm sorry, it was LA, a brave judge in LA who declared them unconstitutional. I thought that took a lot of gumption, didn't it, Judge Espinoza? Yay, Judge Espinoza. And then the case got appealed, of course. So anyway, there's a whole bunch of cases that are glomped together at our state Supreme Court. It's called People versus Mosley. All the briefs are in, been in for months. But the fact is, they don't even have an oral argument date. So the Supremes don't give themselves deadlines. They'll get around to it. 
In the meantime, what are you supposed to do if you're a registrant? I got people that have a choice between being homeless or living with their wife in the home that they own. Is this the United States of America? Yeah. Okay. All righty. Um, so we talk about issues. We um, also correspond through uh, these monthly meetings. Again, because we have so many registrants in LA County, every other month we're in LA back at the ACLU building. After begging and pleading, they've reduced the, the rent from $450 to $325 a, a month. Very nice of them, right? Um, I'm not going on my ACLU rant today. Okay. Um, the public. We also, it's very important to um, educate the public. We've had some limited effect there um, through newspaper articles primarily. Uh, we've sent out a few press releases. I do have a degree in journalism, um, though I could refresh my skills there. And uh, I'm waiting for the perfect person to show up to relieve me of those duties. Um, and, and we really are planning to have a protest. And so good old-fashioned protest. I remember doing that. That was really cool. And uh, we're going to have a fish in. Okay, and why we're going to have a fish in California is our state constitution says there's an unlimited right for every resident, every citizen of the state to go fishing in a public body of water. And because some of these counties and cities have said you can't go there, and besides that, think about what's going to look on TV, right? When they're all marching with fishing poles and going, I just want to go fishing. So anyway, um, that's coming soon. Um, elected officials, uh, gosh gee whiz, remember we incorporated in September of last year, and that's about the time I found out about this wonderful bill that had been introduced in our state assembly by Tom Amiano from San Francisco. He doesn't care what people think about him either. I will quote him. This is the third entry on, when I Googled him. Kiss my faggot ass. Okay, he just doesn't care. He was the first teacher in San Francisco to out himself, and he keeps getting elected, so he really doesn't care what people think of him. And uh, in our state assembly, public service com safety committee is like the lowest thing on the totem pole. But so, so he was senior, and they didn't know what else to do with Tom, so they gave him the public safety committee. This is cool, because guess what? Our issue is public safety, right? And guess what? The, the, this issue also affects the gay community. So I don't know where you are, but California, we have quite a few gay people and gay communities, strong gay communities. And guess what? They care about this issue because a lot of them are ending up on the registry because society does not condone some of their behavior. So, um, so anyway, we ended up going to Sacramento. So we got incorporated in September. I was in Sacramento in September, I, October, November. December, Frank got to go to Sacramento and in the state capitol for the first time, right? And so we had these meetings in Sacramento, and when we were finished, I turned to Frank on the steps of the capitol. I said, guess what you are now, Frank? And he goes, what? I said, you're a lobbyist. <laughs> it's worse than being a registrant. So... <laughs> Anyway, and in January of this year, we actually had 12 individuals who went to Sacramento. And I mentioned in one of the other panels, I think it was one of the panels, but when we went, we had 12 people, we had, and we had 45 appointments. Okay, we met with every Democratic member of the assembly. We just forgot the Republicans because if we, and they have a supermajority. So if we could convince Democrats, we, we thought we had a lot better chance with the Democrats that we would, um, you know, we do that. So every team had a registrant, every team had a family member of a registrant, and every team had a person who wasn't either one but was a professional like myself. And it was dynamo. Let me tell you, we had jaws dropping. And I remember we went into one office, and she just laid it out there, this member of the state assembly. She goes, you are brave to come in my office. And said, yes, we are. She'd never talked to a sex offender before. But she'd passed legislation against sex offenders when she was a mayor. Right? She hadn't bothered to talk to one yet. So she's there, and you read her bio, and she basically says, I hate sex offenders in her bio. Well, she got to meet one that day, got to meet Frank. So um, anyway, that bill, by the way, Assembly Bill 625, would have created a tiered registry in California that would have allowed some people to get off our registry. So a little history, we've had a registry in California since 1947. Okay, people don't get off. 
I know one individual who offended when he was 17 years old. He's been on the registry for 55 years. He's 72, do the arithmetic. He is hoping to get off the registry before he dies, and I can't promise him he will. Okay, unless maybe we can get this tiered registry bill passed. So the bill went down in flames, let me tell you. Um, but the fact is we were there, and we did at least prick the consciousness of many elected officials who said, I've never talked to a, reg a registrant before. Oh my gosh, you're not green. You don't have three heads. Hmm, they kind of look like, like my son-in-law. You know, so whatever it is, um, I highly recommend you do it no matter what the outcome is. Um, another group that we've been educating are professionals. So we have had psychologists here. They're good people to talk to. Okay, they're doing this. The stuff, the decisions that they are making make or break somebody who's on the registry often. They need to know what it's really like to be on the registry because most of them don't. All they know is they do some static 99, come up with some number, oh, hi, moderate, low, whatever, and have a good life. Okay. So part of it is making presentations like this PowerPoint presentation that's up there. Now, I'm not going to go through it. Anybody who wants a copy of it, you're welcome to have it. Give, you know, come up, give me your email address. I'll send you the whole darn thing. Um, it's important. There's some information in here that is not specific to California. And I'm going to get on my soapbox here about... <laughs> I'm going to get in my soapbox here about the case, uh, which I always forget, White versus Doe, Smith versus Doe, Smith versus Doe. They're also Doe's. Um, so anyway, um, the 2003 U.S. Supreme Court case that said that being on the registry was not a punishment. Really? Where in the heck have these people been? Though I highly recommend you read the, des the decision itself. It's actually not that long. There are three dissenting, dissenting justices in that opinion. Okay, there are nine Supreme Court justices. Three of them dissented. We at least had one third of them convinced that this was punishment. Okay, so do the math. We just have to convince two more and we got a majority, okay? <laughs> so I think that there is hope. I compare in this presentation, if I can get there far, fast enough, I'll show you. I compare in this presentation that decision, oh, all these laws. Um, I compare in this decision all these things we've been doing, um, Smith versus Doe, okay, to the case of Plessy versus Ferguson. Now, you might not remember the name of the case, but you sure remember what it was about. Our U.S. Supreme Court in 1896 said that separate but equal education was constitutional, right? Here's a picture. This is, this is what resulted. Oops, oops. Here's a darn photo. There's a nice photo there. <laughs> well, there was anyway. Of American children who happen to be African American trying to enter an all white school, and you got the National Guard there preventing them from doing it. Okay, and George Wallace too. So, <clears throat> so, Plessy versus Ferguson, 1896. Guess what changed its mind? Brown versus Board of Education. In 1954, that was 58 years later. And Norm, I don't know if I have less patience than you or I'm more optimistic or I'm just, what, a Pollyanna, whatever it is. I'll just put this way. I am not that damn patient. I am not waiting 58 years for this decision to be overturned. And I will do whatever I can to make sure this decision is overturned. Okay? And... <laughs> and we need you all, every person in this room, to help get us there. It doesn't happen overnight. You can't go knock on the door of the U.S. Supreme Court and say, we want you to overturn the stupid decision. Okay? It takes a long time to get there. How long are you willing to wait? Now, I know Marilyn, and I haven't had a chance to talk to Brenda yet, but Marilyn uh, supposedly had a case before their state Supreme Court this week where the defense attorney argued that registration in and of itself is punishment. So just in case somebody here doesn't understand why that's important, it's called ex post facto laws, all right? Every state constitution and the federal constitution say you cannot pass any ex post facto law. 
Okay, so what is an ex post facto law? Anything that's applied retroactively. But if they say it's not a punishment to be on the registry, then they can do it. Oh, it's just an administrative requirement. Oh, really? It's just an administrative requirement to live under a bridge? You know, fuck you, US Supreme Court. When are you gonna get your head out of your ass? I forgot to warn you, I'm Italian, and I served in the Navy. So, uh, anybody here offended by four-letter words? Good. All right, so I might let a few more fly then. Okay, so legislation, uh, education was number one, legislation was number two, we worked on the state, went down in flames, but we're going to try again next year. Okay, we learned some things. I didn't do state legislation before. It's different, it's ickier in some, some respects. Like, people know each other. Um, but anyway, um, <laughs> and, those, and the staffers are even younger. It's amazing. Um, so, um, so anyway, then we are dealing with the counties and the cities. And so we have all these presence restrictions. So in El Dorado County, which is a northern county, and they unanimously passed a library ban anyway. I may talk about rectal cranial inversion. Yeah? It's like, what happens? I know they're not in the 10th Circuit, but the 9th Circuit is even more liberal than the 10th Circuit. So, hello? What do you think the 9th Circuit's going to do when we get a case up there? I, I really don't understand. I believe in fairness. I'm a lawyer and I believe in fairness. In fact, I don't even like to sue people. If I can settle a case, I'd much rather settle the case. Okay, I don't want to take it to trial. I don't want to sit in front of a judge even. Let's just be civilized people. Let's reach an accord. But I'm, and so I go to these city council meetings, I send them letters. I tell them, your ordinance is unconstitutional for the following 14 reasons. Okay, oh, and by the way, Orange County is just precious because the district attorney in Orange County has his foot on the fannies of every city in Orange County. He's trying to get every city in Orange County to pass one of these ordinances. Really? So that no registrant can ever find peace and quiet and, and, and enjoy nature, okay? You know, Orange County has a lot of beaches, but registrants can't go to them. You can't go to the pier and go fishing. You can't go to the park and go for a hike. You can't take your family for a picnic. And God forbid that your company you work for has a picnic at a park because you've got to be sick that day. Or fear arrest. And so in Orange County, they said, oh, well, you can apply for a permit. Registrant, you can come apply for a permit. Now, you have to tell us the day, the time, exact location you're going to be. You can apply for a permit. 17 people have applied for a permit in Orange County. 16 of them have been denied. Okay, the only one that was granted, let's see, turns out was the son of a friend of the sheriff. Who's the one that grants the, the permits? Okay, thank you, LA Times, for outing him on that one. Oh, actually, it's a woman sheriff, adding her on that one. I thought better of women. I truly did. So that's what we're dealing with in California. Okay, um, so we're getting to the point, and again, this is a fairness issue. Fairness issue. If the Orange County DA is not going to tell the city of Santa Ana that a public library ban is unconstitutional, I'm going to go tell them. I'm going to tell them in a letter. I'm going to come and testify, right? Oh, and I just have to explain the city council meeting because it was, it was just epic. So however many people of us testified that, that night. And then the last person to testify about their ordinance was the Orange County DA. Okay. And see, he said his usual nonsense. He gets up there, blah, 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 and doesn't say anything except, oh, my God, fear, fear, fear. A child was attacked in this library. Oh, by the way, the person that attacked the child was not on the registry. Right? Duh. So anyway, um, <laughs> the, the DA gets up there, and a member of that city council thought he, that she, the mayor pro tem, Alvarez, would, sh would basically throw a softball question to the DA and ask the DA, what's the true recidivism rate? We know those people lied. We told them 5.3% because that's what it is. 
5.3% according to the U.S. Department of Justice. So contrary to whatever speaker said, we don't have studies. We got studies up the gazoo, okay? We have the U.S. Department of Justice in a study, as a 10-year study, 2003, that said overall their recidivism rate, we're talking about reoffending for a sex offense, not because they got violated on parole or for a DUI. That's really important, okay? For a sex-related offense is 5.3%. And guess what? If they were a child molester, using their terminology, not mine, it's 3.2%. So where is all this misinformation coming from? Okay, so anyway, back to the story. Santa Ana City Council, the DA is there. They're asking, what's the true recidivism rate, Mr. DA, fluttering her eyelashes? And he said, I don't know. And I thought, that, that bastard is either a liar or he's stupid or both. Uh -huh. and, and so <laughs> this is the real irony of the situation. His office gave that city council that report that I quoted from. And they had incorporated the entire report, because it's over 100 pages, the entire report into their ordinance. And yet none of the bastards nah, had read it. Nobody had read it. Even the DA had not read it. This was the 12th city in Orange County to pass one of these fucking ordinances, and he had not read the fucking report. Really? You, I mean, I wanted to sue him for malpractice on the spot. <laughs> this is a lawyer. You've got to know your facts. You know, when you go out and speak in public, I don't know how much money they're paying that man, but it's way too much. If it's over minimum wage, it's way too much. <laughs> So I'll calm down just a minute. Okay, so what I found out about litigation is to be patient. <clears throat> I'm fair. I gave them notice, you know, and then it's like I gave them this information. They didn't use it. They're on notice. This is the accurate information. They don't use it to their apparel. So what's happening in California now is we put together a litigation team, and let me tell you, it is a crack litigation team. I'm there as a cheerleader. I'm not a civil rights lawyer. I have won a $2 billion case, okay? It was contract law. It has nothing to do with civil rights. So anyway, but the fact is that we got some crackerjack civil rights attorneys, and all we're doing right now is we're aiming. What is our target? And our general target is Northern California and Southern California. And Norm, in our state, the feds are the way to go just because of other stupid things our state has done. So we're gonna take our best guess, our best crack on the federal level. And the other thing is in federal court, you can actually consolidate cases, and so we're gonna be able to use resources more efficiently. So when we have an expert witness, we're gonna have that expert witness once. I'm, I'm, I'm throwing this information out. If it's, some of it's sticky to you, it'll stick. If it doesn't, don't worry. Send me an email, I'll do my best to repeat it. So um, we have plaintiffs. You have to have plaintiffs that have something called standing, okay? So you have to have somebody who's on the registry, if it's going to be a civil rights case, who's willing to stick their necks out. I have one in Southern California. Let me explain what a monster this man is. He's just a monster, okay? He served in the military for 16 years. He became a hairdresser, whatever. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he became a hairdresser. He was in a salon one night with an adult patron, and who knows what really happened. She said something, he said something else. The worst charge that was made that he inappropriately touched her. I mean, we're not talking about intercourse. We're not just he, he inappropriately touched her. I don't know if it happened or if it didn't happen. This man, he's been on the registry uh, now for 12 years. When he was on the registry for only 11 years, <clears throat> And he, it's a misdemeanor. His crime is a misdemeanor, okay? In our state, if you have been convicted of one, or pled guilty to one felony sex offense, you are not eligible ever to be considered to get off the registry. And most of the crimes, sex offense crimes in our state are felonies. So, but anyway, this inappropriate touching of, again, of an adult patron in a beauty salon, um, he was eligible after only 10 years to apply for something called a certificate of rehabilitation. So he did. I wasn't his lawyer. 
I, who knows what would have happened. But he lived in Orange County. He had to apply in Orange County. Orange County, remember the dumb DA from Orange County? Okay, that same county. So he applied, and he had to go to state court in Orange County. He applied for a certificate of rehabilitation, which in and of itself would not get him automatically off, but it was the next step to get him off. The judge denied him. And the only reason the judge gave for denying him was one time he didn't renew his driver's license on time. No, I wish I were. This man has no felonies on his record. Hey, Norm, you'd even like this guy for a client. No felonies on his record. He's a clear record, right? I got his life scan report. Um, yeah, and the judge denied him. And the judge said, oh, don't worry. You can come back in two years. So when he comes back, he'll have been on the registry for 13 years. Okay, he is willing to be a plaintiff in a lawsuit. I'm not saying he's going to be a plaintiff, but he's willing to be. And we're busy identifying who in our state is willing to be a plaintiff, and then we're going to be very uh, strategic in who we choose. Okay, um, when you do litigation, let me suggest you've got to find plaintiffs, you've got to find attorneys, and you have to find expert witnesses. It's a whole thing. It's not just one. Just think, oh, I have an attorney who will file a lawsuit, so what? You got to follow through on the lawsuit. I don't think any city is going to voluntarily, the city of Albuquerque said, surely did not do that, write you a check. The city of Albuquerque took the library ban all the way to the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals. That's a lot of time and a lot of money. I don't know who the plaintiff is. It's Doe, Doe versus, Doe versus City of Albuquerque. I don't know who it is, but I don't know if he had deep pockets or ACOU funded or whatever, but thank goodness it happened, and it's going to help us in California. Okay, so um, in conclusion, <laughs> how much time I have. I do want to answer questions, by the way. And I also want to bring up my California team. So I want you to know there are six of us here from California. So if you guys and women would please come up. Come on up. If you don't want to come up on the stage, at least come up here and be counted. So <laughs> Linda, <laughs> Jill, <laughs> Frank, and Kathleen. So I would, and there's one other, are you um, Kevin? Kevin, please come up, Kevin. Uh, we've adopted Kevin. <laughs> he, he's actually on the registry in Texas, but we've adopted him. So question whether or not he stays in California remains to be seen, but he's also the documentary maker. So I would like each one of you, could you do it for maybe one minute and tell them why, you're, why you care about this issue? <laughs> why am I here? I'm here because I'm a mother of a registrant, and I'm also here because of the effects that registry has had on my entire family. My grandchildren, my other children, brothers, sisters, friends, that's why I'm here. And I want, I guess my main goal is that I want to take what experiences I've had because I was so naive, <laughs> so very naive, I want to be able to take those and help other families uh, learn and cope with what has happened to them. Thank you. Ah, uh, let's see, the reason I am involved in this is I I would like to help others, all others, return to peace. This is what we do not live. This is our right in this country to be in peace. That's what the justice system to me is all about. Defining peace, maintaining peace, and once the peace is broken and someone has stepped out of those bounds, they are embraced and brought back into peace so they can be returned to the whole, whole and healthy. I look forward to helping you all return to peace. My name's Linda and my son is on the California Sex Offender Registry and I lived in the closet for 10 years 
comfy closet, professional closet, well-paid closet. And about four months ago, I finally came out of the closet and I went to a meeting, my first city council meeting in Lake Forest, California. And I saw a lady there who got up and took the microphone and kicked the ass of everybody on the committee. <laughs> and being there was like being next to a Bic lighter when the flame goes up. It was like <laughs> And four months later, I have quit my job and I am devoting my time to this cause. And I am here because every time I connect with people who are involved, even peripherally, on this cause, I feel stronger, I feel better, and I'm more positive about my son having a future, damn it. Well, um, I uh, never did fit in closets very well. I'm claustrophobic. Oh. <laughs> Um, um, I have colonial ancestry. My husband has colonial ancestry. Between the two of us, we have a father, a great-great-grandfather or what have you, that served in every war this country ever had back to the French Indian Wars, King Philip's War. Uh, my husband did 28 years in the Navy. Um, I never had a clue that this could happen in this land that I love till my husband got charged with child pornography. And I, you know, I can understand fair punishment for the crime, but I don't think anybody's life deserves to be destroyed and their family for doing one wrong thing. No matter what your loved one did, it's wrong. And I, by the way, I am a descendant of uh, Rob Roy McGregor. I'm not gonna stand for this. <laughs> Uh, I've been registered uh, in Texas since 2000, and I just got tired of trying to be normal. <laughs> you know, I spent years just trying to pretend that thing wasn't there and just to try to, you know, have a good, successful career in television for a while, and, you know, it just... It was always there. There was always that one day at each job where some reporter found out that I was a registrant and random, ran around the station going, oh my God, look who's working for us, and show it to my boss and say, you know, look, do you realize you hired this person? And they're like, yeah, he told us when he interviewed. None of your business. So I had some good bosses, but anyway, I got, you know, I just got tired of, you know, from 2000 to 2011, it was always just this thing that I tried to forget about most of the time, and I decided to just make it my entire life, basically, <laughs> uh, to try to, I just remember how much loneliness and uh, feeling like I was the only person in the world dealing with this. That was the feeling I had for 10 years, and I just don't want other people to feel that way anymore, so that's it. And we have a nickname for Janice, Rocket Fuel. <laughs> I attribute that to my aerospace background. Um, but anyway, <laughs> um, I, I'm going to stay here for questions and answers. I think we actually have at least 20 minutes. But before I do, I want everybody to know this. California is offering to host next year's conference. <laughs> It's not our decision to make, but we've offered. Yes, sir. Oh, can you wait just a moment, please? Yeah, they got to get the microphone to you. <laughs> oh, we're going to. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Um, I, I want to answer Norm's question or remark. So, in the Lancaster ordinance, he's probably not going to say anything else. In the Lancaster ordinance, they do have an exception, which is if you want to go to a park for religious purposes, that you can go. So, if they pass that ordinance, um, we're going to have a religious revival. My husband's a minister. Go <laughs> You're expecting them to turn it on. Testing. Right? There I am. You mentioned during your talk litigation going hopefully to the Ninth Circuit there in California. What exact uh, uh, registry, uh, what sex offender law are you 
going to attack? Oh, um, we're the, our immediate target, because <clears throat> there are multiple, of course, the immediate target are what we call these presence restrictions. So because we have our state Supreme Court already focused on residency restrictions, we're keeping our fingers and toes crossed that they come up with a reasonable decision. I know. And it might happen, not if you were here for... Um, I can't remember her name now. She talked about compromises, okay, and, and also about chipping away at things. So in our state, our attorney general um, is arguing that the residency restrictions are constitutional, but they should be limited only to people on parole. So if that has to be a one way we chip away at it, so be it. Um, but anyway, our first target is what I call the presence restrictions. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, Janice, um, for the record, I want to tell you that I am a history teacher, and you, you should have taken some classes with me. Your <laughs> views on history would have been much more improved. Probably so. Uh, my question is about litigation. Mm -hmm. Are you uh, open to the idea, is your organization open to the idea of uh, having inmates litigate from prison about sex offender-related issues? Um, the one, the target, the ones we're targeting, it wouldn't apply to them because they can't go. Um, but, you know, I'm not opposed to the idea, and I'm happy to put it on our list. Trust me, I have a large list. So let me just mention one, and uh, Norm's a, a, a criminal attorney in another state, so he might not even know about the tort of the intentional infliction of emotional distress. And my theory is that every day that there is a public registry that the government can be sued for intentional infliction of emotional distress. <laughs> Sounds like a class action suit to me. And, and let me just give you a little anecdote about our state and its, and its uh, public registry. Um, it's inaccurate, it's incomplete. Oh, I'm sure you're shocked that government would not do things quite right. And so, I am on a personal crusade. Any registrant in the state of California who's on the public registry, if he asks and gives me a life scan report, I will send a letter to our Department of Justice and request that the corrections be made. The biggest thing's missing is if your crime is probably your offense more than three years old, the year of your offense and the year of your release is missing. Now, why do you think that might be important? We've had a registry since 1947. There's a man who's been on the registry since, for 55 years. Now, do you think if somebody looks at the registry and there's your current photo and it just says you've done X, Y, or Z, that they might think you did it yesterday? Absolutely. Dirty old man, there you go. So the fact is that that's very important information. It's important for employment, it's important for housing, and it's employment, important for vigilante violence. So let me tell you another thing about Frank Lindsay. Frank is a registrant. His name and home address were on the registry. They still are, actually. And the years of his release and year of his offense were not there. Frank's offense was more than 30 years ago. One offense, okay? A man he did not know broke into his house and waited for Frank to come home. And he had two hammers in his hand. They were Frank's hammers. And when Frank walked into his own house, the man said, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to get this right this time. You sick motherfucker. Okay. And then he tried. And the man was younger than Frank and a lot bigger than Frank. But Frank's nimble and he's fast. He had to escape from his own house to escape being murdered. He was harmed, but he wasn't murdered. That was a second registrant that day that man tried to attack. And he pro and he really screwed up because then he went and held up a convenience store and they have cameras. And that's how he got caught. With a machete, right, Frank? Yeah, that's how he got caught. That man is now behind bars for 13 plus years. And when our district attorney, when our DA, <laughs> yeah, when our DA went to charge the man, he refused, I mean refused because Frank asked repeatedly to state that the reason he was chosen for the attack is because he's on the registry. And the DA refused to do it. So we know that the incidents of vigilante violence are so underreported. And that's why it is so important to get 
the public registry corrected, and for God's sakes, let's, tr let's unplug the damn thing. Okay, I mean, I'm ready to sue the state for negligence, and I'll tell you why. I've talked to the woman in our attorney general's office who's in charge of sex crimes. I'm not going to mention her by name. I don't want to be guilty of defamation. So anyway, this is what she told me. Yep, we know. We know there's all kinds of mistakes on the registry. Yep, we're working on it. How long will it take? About seven years. I'm not a patient person. I'm not waiting seven years to sue her and that agency, and she has half a heart. She's done some decent things, but this is awful. It is intentional infliction of emotional distress. Okay, so in conclusion, <laughs> I think I said that before. Um, in oh, another question. I know I'm between you guys and dinner, or so, or at least a drink. I just got an email from one of our members, and her daughter is as not, she's just been informed her daughter has not been accepted for uh, Head Start, which is a federal program. Has anybody else had any problems? I mean, it's a small community, and I know it's based on in income. Their income is very low, and she said there are others who have jobs with more income. Uh, I say it's discrimination. Any recommendations? And she's in California? Dakota. North mm. Dakota. Okay, well, I don't know about the Dakotas, but I will tell you in California, they list all registrants under Penal Code 290. That is the requirement to register. I hate that statute. I just hate it. Except for Penal Code Section 290.46 L, L. And then there's one, two, three. Okay, and the reason... I like that part of it, is this is what it says. It says you cannot discriminate against somebody solely because they're on the registry for housing, employment, credit, and a few other things. And if you are caught doing those things, the person can get damages, monetary damages, attorney's fees, you can get a fine of up to $25,000, and guess what? The government can sue you, uh, you know, uh, criminally. That's what it says. Now, I'm yet to find the first successful person to do that, but I actually had, I filed one lawsuit on behalf of somebody. We ended up settling that one, and I filed the second one. Just re and not, we haven't filed a lawsuit. We drafted one and sent it to a very large investment company that said her husband's incarcerated and said, we're freezing all of your accounts because your husband's incarcerated. And I said, are you telling me that nobody else ha at your very, very, very large headquarters in Boston, um, mutual fund, nobody else is incarcerated or a felon? Oh, no, we didn't say that. We do have felons on who are our customers. But, you know, those people those people. So I'll keep you posted. Next year, maybe we'll have a successful settlement by then. I hope it has a lot of zeros. Paul, you got a question or comment? Yes, I wonder if you could... Uh, I'm interested in this period of time where you decided that you would run California RSOL and have the first meeting. How did you get people involved? You said you sent out a thousand invitations to whom? Oh, thank you. That's a good question. Um, Frank and I, was Mamie involved with us that time? And, and Jill, Jill helped too. So um, we had four people that basically, we did it the old-fashioned way, stuffing envelopes, writing this letter. I wrote the letter. I signed every single letter. Some of them I even put happy faces and hearts on um, by hand. And um, just that human touch, you know. I wanted to know it wasn't a computer. Um, and we got the names and addresses off our registry. We did. You, you sent them to people on the registry. Did you send it did. specifically to the name of the person who was on the registry? Yes. And what we did, um, we chose, um, somebody can manipulate the database for us, and we, he drew concentric circles and said, we said, we want to send 1,000. He picked the 1,000. He said, we're the closest. And how many people came to the meeting? 55, I think. 55. 
So it wasn't an overwhelming turnout, but I will tell you this. I think at that meeting, we raised about $400. So when we have our meetings, we pass the hat. Okay, and whatever people want to put in there, again, $10 challenge, blah, blah, blah. This is how much all the expenses are for this meeting. We pass the hat. And sometimes we break even and sometimes we don't. And in the letter, did you say specifically it was to help get rid of the registry? Uh, what, we say, what we say in the letters, I tell Frank's story and that we're here to address the civil rights of those convicted of sex-related mm -hmm. offenses. Yeah. I, and so that's, I, we also, the very first time we go to a location, we send a sealed letter. The return address says California RSOL, who the heck knows what that stands for, right? Um, so most people open them. Um, not everybody, of course, but most people do. Um, one of the things we've learned, too, by doing these mailings, and we have uh, another nonprofit that does it, I mean, that's what they do for a living. We don't know how to do this. They have bulk mailing. After the first time, the first time we did it, every lick every stamp. Oh God, it took us eight hours. I mean, it was just crazy. So anyway, it's like, yeah, I got to use the brain, not the brawn here now. Uh, and so now we did it. One of the things that we found out was that that little nonprofit, even smaller than us, they could tell us if somebody moved and what their new address is. Our state government's not smart enough to figure it out. They've got the old address on the registry, right? I, and I've told the people at California DOJ about this. I said, you know, you might just want to try this method. And they go, oh, no, that's too hard. Really? We can do it, but they can't do it? Huh? I told them once. I believe in fairness. I really do. I believe in, in giving people information once. And if they don't get it once... Oh, well, they're on notice. And that's why I try to put it in writing, too. I, I'm thinking ahead of, about the court case and say, court, this is what we did. And by the way, city councils these days are wonderful. And the city councils, because they now videotape their, their meetings. And I'll tell you why it's really important. So Norm, you brought up this point about qualified immunity, right? Qualified, unqualified, whatever it is. In other words, they can say whatever the fuck they want to say in their meetings. So we went to a meeting. The DA was at that meeting. Samantha Runyon was there. Do you know who uh, Aaron Runyon is? Little girl, you know, kidnapped from her front yard, raped, murdered. They don't, why can't they tell that she's a, he's a murderer, right? Oh, no, he's a sex offender. So anyway, I mean, they brought everybody out. And there were, there were about seven of us there, I think, from the organization and a few people we met that night even for the first time. And um, the... Uh, the last person to testify, the DA didn't think it was important enough to show up himself, so he sent his number two henchman, who happens to be a henchwoman. This woman, I just couldn't believe it. She looked like a hooker. I was like, who is that woman? You know, when she walked in, she goes pr prancing up to the podium. I was like, oh, shit. So anyway, sorry about that. Um, I've just never seen an attorney dress that way, um, in public anyway. So... Um, <laughs> So she gets up there and she verbally attacks one of our members. And she says, you know, Jeff, I'll just call him by his first name. Jeff, he lied to you, city council. Jeff told you he's on the registry because of child pornography. That's not true. I've seen his record. This is her, not me. And he says, in his record, and she said, in his record, there are photos of him having sex with boys, young boys. This is what she said in a public meeting. I was horrified. I thought, oh my God, I've been misled, right? I'm not about to spill the beans or show anything that night, trust me. But the next morning, I'm on the phone with the public defender going, what the heck? It was absolutely false. It was a big fucking lie, and she knew it. He had, there were no photos of Jeff having sex with little boys because he never had sex with little boys, okay? And yet she could say that in a public meeting and she cannot be sued for saying that. Yeah. That, she can? And legislative immunity only applies to the board members. And her on behalf? We need to talk. We they, need to talk. <laughs> I would love to put duct tape on. Oh, and by the way, she's in, when the DA's term is up in two years, she's the number two, and she's supposed to become the new DA. So I just can't wait to put duct tape on that bitch's mouth. So um, 
<laughs> so what we did, though, I want to tell you, other than that, I don't have strong feelings. So, uh, <laughs> so I want to tell you what we did do, and that is we filed a complaint with the Bar Association. Because the fact is, according to our legal ethics, even if that were true, she should not disclose that to anyone. And so she has breached a legal ethic. I have no idea if anything's ever going to come of it, but you just got to get cold and prickly. I wanted to be Pollyanna. I wanted to be nice. I thought, oh my goodness, if I just bring them the facts, they will make a logical decision. Well, they haven't, okay? We have had one city, Cerritos, in the county of Los Angeles, that when we went up there, and it was a second reading, second and final reading of an ordinance, it was on the consent calendar. All those puppies had to say was yes, and that ordinance was going to turn into a law, including a public library ban. And we went, because we didn't know about it before that, but we went on the second reading, and we said the same thing we always say, please, stop what you're doing. Go do some more research. Oh, by the way, we're available to help. We've got copies of the reports and we can help. So that one city stopped what it's doing and they've put it on hold. Maybe, I will say we had one little benefit there we haven't had in other city council meetings in that we knew that one member of the city council had voted against the ordinance and we gave him ammunition. I talked to him before the meeting, I talked to him after the meeting and we thanked him. And that needs to happen too. When a legis any elected official, no matter what level, does what you ask them to do, you need to thank them. And you need to prop them up so that their colleagues don't do whatever to them, hang them, lynch them, whatever. Yeah. Okay, so um, are we about running out of time? Yeah, I okay. think so. Okay, so in, fi in conclusion, <laughs> wait a minute. Um, folks, I want to say that there is hope and we are making a change. We're what we're doing is we're getting to the tipping point. So if you haven't already read Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Tipping Point, please do. Or maybe you're just familiar with the term. The fact is, we don't know where that tipping point is. We gotta keep plugging, doing what we're doing every day, do these public service announcements, sue the pants off of them, uh, talk to our elected officials, just keep on plugging away, and someday we're going to reach the tipping point. And when we reach that tipping point, those the same elected officials who are too happy to pass an ordinance that does nothing other than, other than deny the constitutional rights of 93,000 plus people and their families, they will be running in front of our parade. And they're going to go say, well, of course registrants have constitutional rights. Well, of course we're going to protect them. And I'm looking forward to that day. Know that it's coming. It's happened before. So on the HIV issue, if you remember, there was a time when most people thought if anybody was HIV positive, it was a death sentence for them, and you sure didn't want to be around them. Didn't want to be in the same room, breathe the same air. Oh, my God, that you might touch them, right? Until what happened? Magic Johnson announced publicly he was HIV positive. And people went, holy shit, I like Magic Johnson. I've watched him play basketball for years. I wouldn't mind being in the same room with Magic. If Magic wanted to shake my hand, I'd shake his hand. I, that was the tipping point for that issue. I don't know what it's going to be for us, but it's there, and we're going to get there. So really, in conclusion, I'm going to say, we are all in this together, and we shall overcome. <laughs>